What's up legends? I'm gonna be spilling the secret sauce today on how to create this realistic stone wall inside of Substance Designer. My goal is to simplify different processes that will allow you to explore and really create a material that's believable in your environment. We'll be going through all of these different colored frames that you see here in the project, and you can imagine each chunk is a way for us to achieve a specific look or to set something up that will help us down the road to uh, achieve the look that we want. And hopefully, even for people that are more advanced in designer or making shaders, we'll walk away with some new workflows or ways to think about this process and give them some new ideas to make some badass things. We're starting with a tile sampler just to give us some disheveled looking squares that we're going to use with a distance node. And that's just to give us a little bit more variety on our shapes instead of like a, a typical brick, right? And after that, we're getting this edge detect going that's just going to separate these shapes for us so we can use it later with a flood fill. So once we have these shapes established, we're moving on to a directional warp just to shift those shapes around a little bit. And don't worry if you're getting these kind of like rounded figures right now. It doesn't matter as much. It, it may not feel like a brick yet, but we have so many things that we're doing that will break it up. We're warping it again with this crystal noise, and that's just giving a little bit more directionality and sharpness and one more Gaussian, and that's just to further distort our base shape. So that is the initial tile creation. And if we go ahead and move over here to our large edge chipping, that's when we first start introducing our flood fill. Now, flood fill, uh, basically it, it needs a black and white shape. So like the imagine the black lines is like being the contour of your shape and flood fill will uh, use those forms to uh, create a flood fill node and then you can do different uh, options with them such as the flood fill gradient and multiple other flood fill options. Once we have this flood fill created, we're plugging it into a flood fill gradient and what we're doing here, essentially we're, we're wanting to just isolate random angles and corners of the flood fill and then we end up turning that into another flood fill to create random grayscale values. And this flood fill to random grayscale is another one of the flood fill nodes that you can use off of a flood fill. And once we have that created, we're using a histogram select. It allows you to specify where on the black to white grayscale range you would like to select and highlight and create a mask out of. So we're just selecting random values out of that flood fill grayscale. And we are making a mask and then we are subtracting our flood fill gradient up here. I made another flood fill gradient out of this flood fill. And with that, we're slope blurring it by our previous flood fill, just to change up the edges a little bit. But you can see there is some distortion. And then we use a, an anti-aliasing here, just to clean up some of those edges. It's not perfect, but if you look at it before and after, it's just a little cleaner. It's enough for what we need. And then I use a levels node to kind of make those pop and be a little bit stronger when we subtract them. I'm not even trying to remove them completely. I'm just making some sharper cuts on some of these corners. And this worked well for what I was doing. You could remove them completely or take this further, but this is enough to just start adding some variety early on. So once we have that shape, we're gonna plug it back into a flood fill and you can see where we chopped off. Those are no longer reading as like big parts of the brick. And that's really what I wanted. So even though it's not perfect here, it's doing just fine at this stage. So we have our tile creation and our large edge chipping. And now we're moving to flood fill and angles. So this is like a super essential step whenever you're creating any kind of brick or various leveled and angled shape. We have our flood fill and we also have our flood fill to grayscale, which is just making random grayscale values off of our shape. We have a, another flood fill grayscale up here, which I just wanted as a mask. And then I clamp it just to make sure. And then I bevel it, slightly round out the edges. There's a pattern specific option, which lets you kind of round out your brick. And that's essentially what I'm doing right here with this bevel node, but we're doing it with a shape that's not just a square, so it's a lot cooler. So with that bevel shape, I'm actually going to just multiply that on top of our flood fill grayscale. So we go from our, our random grayscale values to our beveling on that now just so it rounds it out, makes it feel a little bit more organic and aged. And now I'm gonna walk you through the process of what is repeated right here. So just know that you have a beveled random grayscale brick shape at this point. So now we move on to our flood fill gradient and each one of these are just different angles of grayscale. And they're very subtle values, but what we're doing on each one is doing a min darken with these gradients to give it different angles and slopes. That way, once we repeat this on each stage of the process, you can see that there's variation in subtle 
height changes and crisp edges on some of these parts. So if we take a peek at what the grayscale value is doing, even though this is the final product, if you're looking in here, you can see that there's slight sloping in these edges on each one of these shapes, like right here where this edge wear is, that's a result of the min darken angle variation. So once we get to the end of the initial angle creation using the min darken and random flood fill gradients, that's when we move into slope blur shape breakup. This is where we really start getting some organic variety within our bricks. So our first one is a slope blur grayscale with a very low min mode. The intensity is at 0.2 and we're using a black and white spots. If we click on it, here's our original, and then here's that. Very subtle, but it's enough to start breaking up the shape, and we repeat this process again. 0.1 this time, different value, uh, different spots parameter. And we do a larger one here. So this is a 1.49, a lot larger, but the, the black and white spots are also larger. So this really just pushes the bricks down. If we look at the previous one, and the new slope blur, there's just a lot more depth and angling going on. And I do that once more with a purlin to really distort the shapes and add more depth. Pretty simple, but a really powerful process. Now that we have that out of the way, we're gonna go to our non-uniform vector warp. So I'm gonna walk you from left to right and then I'll explain what happened up here. So we're plugging the last one of our slope blur grayscale into a non-uniform directional warp. And really that's just moving these values around with whatever's plugged into the intensity and the warp angle. You don't have to always use a warp angle, but in this case, I wanted the a little bit of the value to be controlled by that warp angle as well. If we look at our previous node and then we open up our non-uniform, there's just a little bit of directionality that's pushing uh, along with the movement of this directional warp here, which is just, just a purlin noise and a crystal. We auto level that non-uniform directional warp. And then I also have a levels afterward, just so I can tweak it to what values I want, even though there is an auto levels there. And just like before, I'm using a histogram scan, but in this case, I'm using it to basically select everything that is not the crevices or where mortar might be. So like all of the actual stone itself. So what's being created up here is a flood fill random color. And this is using the flood fill we created at the very beginning before we did the angles. And the reason we're using this is because you can use this vectors, these colors for a vector warp to give a lot of randomization to different shapes in your object. So before that, we had this very obvious galvanic large noise that would have continued as one shape across our object. But once we warped it, you can see that it shifts all of those patterns onto bricks individually in a unique way. And then I slope blur it just to kind of soften it and give it a little bit more variety up close. And then we're overlaying those patterns very subtly over our values. So I just didn't want to overlay them in the darkness, even though with overlay, it shouldn't have really created a value, but just to make sure I masked out the bottoms so those would not appear. All of that's just to give a unique little pattern across all of these bricks. So we have our, our shape, our brick starting to get a little bit of detail, and now we need a way to put some cracks on there in a very uh, tasteful way. Is I use a tile sampler to make these random dots that are a disc, and I use a histogram scan to basically clamp it and just make it black and white because you need that as a mask input. Then we're going to use a distance node with that in the source input. Make sure your tile sample has random grayscale values, and then that's going to give us this pattern. And it, it, you have more control over it than a typical cells and you can add it and make it feel a little bit more organic. So that's why I'm using it. And we're detecting edges, like our initial cracks that might run through the shapes. It's like we did before, we're gonna use a flood fill and that's gonna create these flood fill patterns within our black and white shapes. And we're gonna do a flood fill to random grayscale twice. That's just so we can select different values and have different values for our, our histogram scan. Now let's go over to our blend. So we're taking our edge detect and we're putting this new crystal noise into it as a min darken and it's only going into the shapes right here so the reason i'm doing a min darken is so we still have those lines even though the ma the masks should handle that as well so we have our new crystal shape being blended into that along with a, a separate one here and then we're detecting those edges so they're very fine and they're a little bit sporadic but we, it's just to add a little bit of variety to our shape and now we need to start making these cracks feel more organic so once we have these cells kind of laid out with a little bit of randomization in there with the crystals, we're gonna start doing some directional warp and blurring. So our first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna invert it because we know that we want white values where the cracks are so we can subtract them from our shape. So now that we have this inverted grayscale value, let's start moving it around a little bit. 
So you can already see we went from very straight lines to something a little bit more flowing, more natural. Maybe it's too curvy for what you want, but you, you can adjust that and find a value that works for you. And I'm using the same noise with just a different direction and intensity over here. And then I'm warping it again with crystal. And then we're slope blurring with the same crystal we used. I'm just trying to save performance and reuse nodes where I can at this point. So we go from warping to blurring, and that's just going to give us a little bit more tapering and different height values for our cracks. Slope blur it again. That's going to further break it up. And again, very minimal, like 0 0.05 is very subtle, but it works. So once we have our cracks at, at this stage, we're going to warp it. And that same black and white spots that we're using to warp, just because I'm trying to reuse, I'm bringing down to our vector warp and blur cracks, which I'll show you what that is in a second. Warped it, and now we're doing that vector warp, which is the same thing we did with the bricks when we overlaid that pattern. And all it is doing is it's taking our crack pattern here. This mask is shifting those patterns around so the cracks don't connect and they're all unique per the brick. And then after that, one more slope blur grayscale. And this time it's a little bit stronger just because at this stage when I was testing it, I wanted more of the cracks to kind of fade in and out depending on the noise. Now we need to set up the mask of where these cracks are going to go. So previously, once we made that overlay pattern for the stone, we're plugging that into the background of our next blend. And we're subtracting those cracks we made, but we need an area for the, the cracks to uh, subtract from, the, the mask for it. And all we're doing for that is we're using a flood fill to random grayscale based on another, um, well, the previous flood fill we had in our flood fill angles. So I'm just grabbing it as a flood fill. And I'm also using, so I have a flood fill gradient down here that's off of that flood fill. And all I'm doing with that is I'm clamping the values a little bit more so I have more of an isolated range. And then I'm taking that previous flood fill random grayscale, also clamping those values, and just using that to subtract more areas. So before I subtracted, there was this many spots for the cracks to go. After I subtracted, here's what we're left with. And I wanted the values to be like this because I wanted more of the, of the subtraction to happen at the edge of the stone and fade off. And since it's already a weak value, it's going to be very subtle. For example, if we're looking at this shape here and I up the subtraction, you can see those cracks really start popping out. Same thing in here in our demo. Uh, you can see where the indentations are. But I, I wanted it to be more subtle in this case, but you can definitely make this a custom tool and then we get to hover you would like. So once we got that, that taken care of, we're getting closer and closer to some of the finer details. So we have these cracks in here now. And the next thing is subtle stone surface subtract. So before we overlaid some detail, but now we're going to subtract a little bit of height variation. So the height information that I made was based on, so we have a crystal and a Perlin noise. And I'm just warping that Perlin noise by that crystal. Well, I'm warping the crystal by the Perlin noise two times. And I'm doing a multi-directional warp right here just to kind of soften it up so it's not quite as harsh. And I'm blur. Well, I have this blur here just in case I want to blur it further. I turn this down to zero because it was actually fine at this stage, but it's there just in case. And once we have that, I'm going to slope blur it by black and white spots just to give it more of these ridges. Really low value, 0 0.06, but I have my normal cranked up at the end so it reads pretty well. And after that slope blur grayscale, we're going into a non-uniform directional warp grayscale using the same black and white spots initially. You can see that really warped this shape up quite a bit. And that's because I, I wanted a little bit more abstract rock shapes. That you'll, you'll see how they uh, affect the shape here in a minute. And we're just plugging our, crack, our cracked stone straight into the background here. And again, with histogram select, I'm just finding values that I want to subtract from. And actually, instead of a subtract, again, I am doing another overlay. I, I need to the change the name of that. But yeah, we're just overlaying these details. So if we look back here, this is before, and this is after. Very subtle, but in the end, it ends up reading quite a bit. And it also pulls down some of those high values so, so they're not quite as sharp or coming towards the viewer more than you want to. Fine edge breaks, this is just a fairly heavy slope blur grayscale, and it's using the same black and white spots. Just reusing nodes where I can, where I liked. Um, I, I messed around with this slope blur grayscale quite a bit, um, and this is a value that I ended up liking because it was a little bit more rugged. I wanted aged stone. It was a look that I liked, but you could change this or do whatever you want for your own material. Once we're at this stage, we're really close to finish with a stone before we put in the mortar. 
So this is just a concrete overlay. There's a really awesome grunge concrete node inside of Designer. And all we're doing is we're overlaying that as well. So uh, we take our slope blur grayscale, put that into the background, and it's very subtle here actually, but it reads in the shape. So these little like pock marks and like very subtle scratches on the surface, that is heavily driven by the grunge concrete and also the mask. The mask itself helps contribute to that because we're using a grunge rough dirty and we're subtracting a moisture noise from it. That way it's just basically only splashed in on these areas in the mask. So it's very subtle. And that is the creation of the stone. But now we need to blend in the mortar. And to do that, I wanted to simplify it as much as possible to make it really quick for the user. So I have a moisture noise here and a black and white spot. I have the levels basically just to bring the black and white values towards the middle a little bit so they're slightly more gray. And then I'm warping the moisture noise by the black and white spots, just enough to give it some movement here. You can see that before, pretty uniform, afterward, getting some distortion and flow. And then I'm doing that again with the black and white spots. So the black and white spots becomes the base. Then I'm warping it by the warp that I just made. And again, making it slightly more gray so it's a little bit more uniform. And that's actually our height blend. So right here, if we look, this is before the mortar and this is after. And it reads pretty well. I didn't want something too sloppy in this case. In this case, I wanted a fairly uniform mortar with a little bit of dis uh, distortion and flow. If we look at the warp angle here, I have it pointed up, but it's actually like making the mortar look like it's coming down. That's just to give it a sense of gravity. There's a lot more tricks and nuance to making a, a really gravitational feel for mortar and things like that. But I wanted to speed up the process and this result worked really well for me. So now that we're at this stage, everything from this point on deals with color and it's really important. And I'll walk you through my color workflow. You know, everyone kind of has their own taste and you know, you like to have fun and experiment and find what works for you. So that's our shape creation. And let's go up here and start with our color and I'll explain how these masks are involved as well. So initially for the color stone base, I, I named all of these color just so you could follow along easier. So we have our grunge galvanic large, uh, two different versions, and I have a gradient map. Now when I'm making gradient maps, typically I have a pure ref pulled up and I'm just uh, swiping the eyedropper across it to find color ranges that I like until I'm satisfied. It's a hack, but it works really well. So I'm taking those two different values. I have this HSL just to bring down the darkness a little bit. And then I'm copying them into each other just to give more variation. So here's it initially, and here's them copied together. It just adds more realism. So this is gonna be the background shape, but we need a way to signify individual bricks. And to do that, it's pretty simple. What we're doing is from way back in the beginning where we had this flood fill, because the, the shapes are still there, essentially. And what I'm doing is I'm taking that flood fill and I'm like, hey, let's put in these random colors within those flood fills. And uh, I'm using a flood fill to color. And in this case, I'm using another galvanic large gradient map. And it's going to pick colors from that map to put on these flood fill stones. And then I'm uh, overlaying those colors on top of the base color. And the mask is being driven from our mortar. So the mortar actually has a height mask here that you can straight up drag out. And I know that, well, it's inverted. So initially it comes out like this because that's where the mortar went. All you gotta do is invert that and then, then you have your stones. That's exactly where the stones are. And if it's not quite lined up perfectly, you can just adjust the values until you make sure that you're just on the stones. So that's the initial color pass. So now we're moving into form emphasis. And this is just a way to start bringing out some different color values uniquely amongst other stones. And essentially what it is, is we have a new gradient map that's being driven by the shape of the stones before we plugged into the mortar. I'm actually using this mask itself for several different colors. So right before the mortar blend, I'm just grabbing the stone straight up, creating a gradient range that is unique and kind of conforms to the shape of the stone. And I'm copying that in. Without it, I see that it's more flat. And with it, some of that color kind of comes out. And then up here, same thing getting another range of colors and values that conform to the shape of the stone, and we are blending it in with copy. So now for some more local color variation, we're using that same mask, but this time I'm using histogram select to isolate very specific spots, and I'm making a gradient ramp out of it. That way the color itself also doesn't have a lot of variety in the gradient, 
and it's more localized. So before, here's our colors, and here's after. Just a little darker, just a little bit of shifting in the hue, and the same thing right here. This one's really subtle, and this is because there's less spots. So I just wanted a few little blue highlights. So right here, you can see before, there's nothing, and after, there's this shift of blue hue. Very subtle, but stacking colors like this really helps get a realistic result. So now at this stage, we're blending in the color of the mortar, and essentially that's just being driven down by this color mortar here. So this is where I make the color. And we're taking the mortar mask and we're making two different gradient maps. And then we're just copying them together. And depending on which value you like more, you can have it blend less or more in that direction. And then I'm feeding that in up here and we're copying it. And this is the mask we're using. And if you want it to blend harder, you can actually just increase the whiteness value in your mask. So after that color mortar blend, we need to start making some of the stone edge damage. And to do that, we have curvature masks that we have to make. Right here next to the curvature mask, I also have an uh, AO node, which is a HBAO node, which makes ambient inclusion from your height or whatever grayscale map you're using. Feeding that into also a normal Sobel to make a curvature Sobel and curvature smooth. So how I make my curvatures is I actually blend the two together. Here's the Sobel by itself and here's the smooth by itself. And then I'd blend them together just to have more variety and realism on my curvature, more to play with and more details. So I'm using that curvature to feed into the dirt mask and also these edge damages. Edge damages is being driven by the AO and the curvature mask. The edge wear is just being driven mainly by the curvature mask and I'm max lightening to bring up all the white values of them together. I am then subtracting all of the mortar spots because I only want the edge damage to appear on the stones. And that's where our mask is. So then for the color, I just take a moisture noise and I get like a lighter colored kind of worn stone gradient. And then we're just copying that with a 0.7 value right on top. Before and after, you can see these speckles of edge damage. And you can play with the value of that quite a bit. It's like right here, it's more prominent. But really it, it helps bring some age and story into your materials. So like this is a very important step. I would spend a lot of time finding the right values. After that, we're moving into dirt, and this is basically right where it ends. So we have our dirt mask created, and the dirt mask is being driven by curvature and AO. Nothing too fancy, but there is a lot of variety, and a lot of that comes from the extra curvature information we have. And that's being plugged into a gradient map here, just a dusty dirt, using this HSL to bring down the lightness, make it darker. And then I'm copying that at about half strength. The mask itself is just the dirt mask. Now there's different techniques you can use here. You don't always have to use opacity. You can just straight up blend it over top. And sometimes if you're having trouble with your texture feeling believable, that might be what you need. Just remove your mask and just blend the dirt right on top. In this case, I liked it better with the mask because it helped emphasize some of the stone forms, but just experiment and play around. And really simple at the end, for my normal strengths, I always use a Sobel and I crank it up to 20. You can see that this reads really well. And I'd rather have a little bit stronger of a normal here because if I'm bringing it into Unreal, I can always bring it down, right? So I'd rather have more detail than I need and be able to bring it to a more realistic place than not have enough and then try to force it and then it gets pixelated and doesn't feel very good. Uh, underneath this, a really simple trick for my roughness was just taking the last height map itself and having a levels node underneath. So I'm actually subtracting, what is that? So I'm subtracting the mask from my levels. So first I wanted to set a gradient range of the average uh, roughness of this shape. So you can see that I made the mortar more rough than the stone. And in this case, I'm doing that just so when the player is running around, they might have a little bit more glistening or sheen of some very subtle variety on the stone, uh, just to catch their eye and be cool. It might not be 100% realistic, but it's probably gonna look better and have more fun. Um, and then I'm subtracting that grunge overlay from the concrete to also add a little bit more variety within there as well. Uh, I could have shifted this around some more so it's not as uniform, but it's so subtle that it's really just for variety. And then I ended up adding the dirt back in as very rough. So here's before and here's after. And I just wanted the dirt to be super rough. So that way when there was any light catching on the stone, it would uh, be more interesting and the dirt would feel really aged and rough uh, along with the mortar itself. No metal, AO is super simple. That's just your HBAO again, 0 0.02. For the height, this is a height map frequency, which you can just pull right off of your last height map or your grayscale value map. That pretty much sums it up. I know I kind of sped through some of those parts, but I wanted to, to keep the momentum going inside of the tutorial, not to drag it on, because if I spent all the attention to detail and nuance and all the nodes, this would be an hour long tutorial and I just wanted to provide as much value as fast as I can and hopefully drop a little bit of that secret sauce onto all of you advanced and intermediate users and maybe also to inspire new people thinking about trying out designer.
It's one of my favorite softwares, and I think it's an essential tool to understand how to make textures and materials for your games. I know the industry itself is changing, and there's a lot of new tools, specifically in the AI realm, uh, that is really throwing things for a loop, but that's okay. Understanding this process and having an artistic eye and knowing how to really art direct what you're creating is a crucial skill that will help you no matter where any of this uh, industry goes. I really appreciate you guys sticking around and making it all the way to the end. Um, I did just launch memberships for the channel, which comes with a few different perks, such as uh, emojis and shout outs. I also plan on making membership only videos for those that are really interested to really dig into the nitty gritty. Uh, I do plan on making Discord a lot cooler. I know I haven't put a lot of time and effort into that as yet. I've been really busy, but I plan on getting somebody on board to really amp that up and make it cooler for you guys to hang out and be around. Go ahead and hit that like and subscribe, share it with a friend, and until next time, see ya.